uh, the best place where I suppose you can see at least the parade example of where you can see this paradox in my view, which is not an answer to your question, but simply a, a restatement that this is the grammar of the way the Bible handles it, uh, is the Joseph story when it, in chapter 50, Joseph uh, conditions his forgiveness of his brothers with the line that uh, everything that you intended for evil, God intended for good. Uh, and, well, he says it more sharply in chapter 45, you think you sent me down here, but actually God sent me down here to, you know, save, uh, uh, you know, enormous amount of people. And of course, according to the Joseph story, he saves not only his family, but uh, the entire world, everyone in Egypt and everyone who comes down to Egypt. Well, what is one supposed to make with that, make of that clause? You actually read the Joseph story. It's a striking narrative, unlike all the other narratives in Genesis, because God never appears. He never speaks in anybody's ear. He never tells God anything. Everybody seems to act completely on their own recognizance. They are making freely willed decisions. Yet Joseph at the end of the day says that, well, you all thought you were making freely willed decisions, but somehow God in his greater providential care uh, made all of, uh, all of this work uh, to his providential end. And you know that's an enigma within Christian theology. Uh, that is, you know, fundamentally unsolvable, and you've you've found a, you know, a good element here. But uh, you know, I can't I can't do any better than state the problem and give you, you know, dozens of biblical examples of uh, where else it occurs. Doctor Fails. Um, uh, just a just a minor point, or maybe it's not such a, a minor point. Um, you make the claim. Uh, which may be true for all I know, but I, I just want to raise the question that uh, Israel is unique in two respects. Number one, uh, that uh, it uh, found its identity uh, in part in a divine promise to a land before it ever occupied the land, and secondly, uh, is unique in uh, its ability to sustain its national identity uh, without the land. Um, <clears throat> I can't uh, actually off the top of my head parade uh, other examples that might be comparable, but uh, I'm just wondering how sure we could possibly be of uh, those assertions, especially the, the, the former one. You probably can't be assured, assured of any assertion. Certainly there's no proof of any divine activity uh, in um, uh, some complete and final sense. Uh, Walker Percy, from whom uh, I derive, uh, derive inspiration on that point, refers to it as a sign uh, of the existence of God and the promise to Israel. And I guess that's probably where I would want to leave it, not a proof. A sign that demands explanation. And one explanation is divine providence. To my left right here, the gentleman in the front. Thank you for your paper. I really mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Um, so I wonder if, or I'm starting to feel like there's, uh, this dynamic is there. Um, Saeed says, this story lauds what's essentially an act of injustice. And so we shouldn't I'm sorry, be, what? Uh, Saeed says, yeah. this story you know, praises this action that's really an action of injustice. And we should be worried about it for that reason. Mm -hmm. And then you say, um, well, it's, it's really it's a conditional promise, and it involves the sins of the Canaanites. And in that way, to quote, the acquisition of the land is not only grounded in justice, mm -hmm. I, and then brackets, the sin of the Canaanites must come to full term prior to their eviction. So your thought is, well, no, it's not really an act of uh, injustice because it has this condition on it. And I'm wondering if Saeed or someone else is going to say, okay, but now, but what sort of justice is this? It's a justice that looks like it involves something like collective punishment, you know, including women and children. And it looks like it's a kind of justice in which people are punished for something that they didn't really do, the whole idea of full term, 400 years. Uh, and so I'm just imagining someone saying, well, it's right. You've got the kind of logic of, you've seen the logic of the story and how it's being told. But for us, that, that doesn't assuage any of our, our initial worries, either the conceptual ones or the practical ones. It looks like something that we're still going to have a hard time identifying as justice, and it looks like something that, practically speaking, might well be something to be worried about. After all, it, it's going to be pretty easy to tell a story about why the people that you're kicking off their land deserved it, as it were, because of those problems. So I'm just wondering if there's going to be that kind of back and forth, and then what your thought is to someone who says that about the 
the picture of justice, you know, and wants to put that in scare quotes. Uh, to, well, in talking I think about this the kind of justice here. is, I mean, it's the same justice that God will administer to Israel herself, is that um, God shows extraordinary patience. He could presumably, after a generation, uh, dismiss a people from its land, uh, but rather he waits centuries. He'll wait centuries for Israel. Uh, he waits centuries with the Canaanites, and, you know, as, uh, I mean, it's anthropomorphic language, but anyone who's been a parent certainly understands it. You know, you give your kids, you know, a long leash. You say time and again, don't do X. They do it for the umpteenth time, then, you know, uh, uh, a significant uh, punishment then uh, applies. I mean, I think that's, isn't that justice? Would that be justice in your mind? Well, I mean, the ancient Israelite thinks of individuals at, in, within, the ter within the terms of the collective. That's true. It's, I can see in this group, um, that's hard for people to get their minds around. For example, the text that bothers some people doesn't bother me at all is the text that God will punish people to the third and fourth generation. That's reflective of sociopolitical facts. I mean, the best example I could give you of that in the modern world would be the French and the British dividing up uh, the Middle East uh, into phony nation states after the close of World War I. Uh, we're living with the sins of that today. The sin, and we could have all the French and all the British stand up and apologize to the whole world, and it wouldn't make one lick of difference because it's done. And we are the heirs of what they have left before us. That's what that biblical text means. Ezekiel presents a different teaching because now Israel is bereft of nation and state. She is a set of individuals, uh, and the social context has changed. But that's also the thinking here that, you know, uh, I remember when I visited um, uh, Berlin uh, after the, uh, just before the wall fell, um, you know, the extraordinary difference between the East and the West, the only way you could understand it was the way in which the Allies, you know, divided up this city uh, as a means of bringing uh, the war to an end. But those people suffered miserably, uh, generations uh, um, or decades for the decisions someone else made. That's human life. That's socio-political life. That's what the Bible's about. But we're not, you know, we, so, people make, we organize ourselves as political units and decisions that are made last long periods of time. I'm sorry, could we, could we refrain from the dialogue? If we could move to the um, gal in the back here about the third row. Yeah, whitehead. Sorry to cut you off. Um, Professor Anderson, as I understand it from your presentation, um, Uriel Simone's links the historical persistence of the Jewish people to this particular providential claim to the land. Mm -hmm. Do you think that his argument is um, altered or affected in any way by historical movements such as uh, the rise of nationalism in the modern era? I guess this is kind of a follow-up to um, uh, the other question. Well, certainly. I mean, there's no question of that. Um, but I think what he's trying to, he, in, I mean, I didn't r raise it in this article, his fish to fry really in the, ch in the chapter in which he presents it is to try to provide an explanation uh, for the present modern state of Israel that doesn't accord with the ultra-Orthodox who deny its legitimacy hook, line, and sinker uh, because it's a, you know, a human work, not a divine work. He's a religious Zionist, but also trying to distance himself from, uh, you know, the, uh, the settlers on the West Bank that feel it's their land and they can do anything. Uh, so that the promise of the land to Israel is eternal, but um, Israel must live on the land and occupy the land in a way in which befits uh, the character of God who gave that, you know, land to the people in the first place. And so that story of Abraham and Lot for him is extremely important, the generosity of Abraham uh, <coughs> to Lot. Because uh, is that, that's the way in which Israel's control of the land uh, is predicated. And if Israel wants to remain on the land, uh, she must act within the context of uh, her founding narrative. That's, that's, his, that's his larger story. Clearly, Zionism is related to the, at some level to the rise of the modern nation state. I mean, every, every aspect of Israel's existence, you could find contingent historical markers that explain. But I think for the 
theological, theologically inclined person like myself, who like Paul believes that the promises to Israel are irrevocable, um, 